Hey everybody, hope you're all doing good. Just uh, time for another story from the past I'd like to share with you today. And today's uh, uh, topic is sort of a sentimental one for me. Uh, it's about one of the most incredible people I've ever met in my life. And um, I've had, I was fortunate to have, call him a good friend for many years. And that was uh, Rodney Schmolak, or uh, Sergeant Major, Army Ranger, Sergeant Major uh, Rodney Schmolak. And the story behind this is um, in the, uh, I think it was <clears throat> like in the 19, or excuse me, in the, <clears throat> in the 2002 or three season, uh, we were fishing an FLW tournament down on the Mississippi River. And that's the one that I posted about where I ran 190 miles one way all week long. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> anyway, Excuse me. I met Rodney at this particular tournament because he was my second day partner on that particular tournament. And the day, and I didn't know anything about Rodney when I fished with him. He was a co-angler on the FLW tour. Um, the time we met, he was in his early fifties. And uh, uh, like I said, I didn't know him at all, and I explained what I was doing, and uh, he had no problem with that. And uh, I didn't know anything about his past at that point. And so we ran down there, you know, I literally fished for 15 minutes, had ran 190 miles, fished for 15 minutes. And then we ran back. And that was the day that it was just a nightmare running back. It took Rodney and I four and a half hours to get back. Um, it, it was just hard charging as fast as I could go. Super, super rough water. And I, it was so, it was such a long ride and it was such a uh, a uh, a violent boat ride that I, I had brought a pillow with me because my literally my butt was so sore and raw from the friction of the boat seat for riding that har far in that rough of water that um, I just couldn't hardly sit down and uh, and Rodney on the way back there you know uh, four and a half hour boat ride super rough water he never complained one time and and when he got back, he literally had blisters on his rear after we, we ran in. So anyway, we just sort of hit it off. Um, we just, I really, we just really vibed with each other and hit it off. And uh, I invited him uh, to be my co-angler practice partner, you know, for the next tournament. And as it turned out, over the, we did, he, he was my full-time co-angler practice part, partner for like the next five years. Um, he fished the co-angler side on the FLW tour. Did really well. I qualified for several uh, FLW cups on the co-angler side. Had several second place finishes. Um, really an excellent angler. Um, but the thing about Rodney that that uh, was so special about him was just him himself as a person. Um, and I wanted to share a little bit about Rodney's life with you all because if if I don't share this or if it's not. Uh, you know spread around it'll just die and it'll die off and nobody will ever know the story uh you know behind some of the incredible things that he did actually you could probably make a movie on it probably make a, a good movie but um over the course of years after we'd fished a couple years uh, rodney started opening up to me about his experiences in vietnam um he served three tours in vietnam with the army rangers he was a team leader um, and I can't tell you that, you know, he, once I got to know him and once we got, became really close friends, he started opening up to me about some of the, uh, the horrors of war that he experienced, uh, in three tours of Vietnam. And, uh, at that point, our friend, our bond really became close. We formed a really close friendship because, um, I just, he really needed somebody to talk to and I, you know, he felt comfortable talking to me about it and sharing some of those experiences with it. Um, but I want to share one story that he told me, He out of many that he told me about that. But I asked him one time, you know, because back then it's like you you only had to serve one tour in Vietnam. But he chose to go to three tours. And he told me, he said, he goes, I felt that I needed to come back for three times for three tours because he said... I, I knew so much about what I was doing and I was so 
aware of what was going on in the war and uh, you know the missions that we were trying to do I just felt that if I didn't go back a lot of people would die and I felt that I could save a lot of lives if I continued to go back and and lead these missions that I was leading and Rodney operated um, on a he had a five-man team um, that he basically ran as as, as the sergeant and the rangers and he told me this one story, and I just, I never will, will forget it out of many that he told me. Um, but, and I wanted to share this with you because it's just the remarkable aspect of it and how somebody could actually come back and, and function in society after that. But he said it was 1968 and he was on this uh, mission and he, his team, his five-man team had gotten dropped off um, on this hillside uh, in North Vietnam and they basically, it was, a, it was a reconnaissance mission where they had got had some intelligence that there was a, a big movement of Viet Cong moving down towards a certain area and they wanted to send Rodney's team in there to sort of scout it out and um, so they dropped Rodney on his team off in a helicopter and little did they know that um, some of the intelligence they had was wrong and like with a quarter mile away on the hilltop there was a battalion of 1500 Viet Cong right there when they dropped him off and the helicopter took off and it, like immediately they knew that that battalion was right there so they set it back down and of course you know the battalion of Viet Cong they heard the, the helicopters coming in so they rushed over to that area and as and Rodney and his team were getting back, they were trying to get on the helicopter. Helicopter was taking fire. Um, all of them jumped on the, the runners of the helicopter and they started to lift off. And Rodney said that he, uh, he, he was the last one on the chopper. And when he grabbed a hold of the railings, the helicopter came up real quick and he had his hand on a real sharp part of it and he simply couldn't hang on and he fell off the helicopter, fell like 20 feet down off the helicopter and the helicopter took off. And he was captured by the Viet Cong uh, at that time. And I can't really go into a lot of detail about, you know, you know, some of the torture that he experienced, you know, once he was, once he was captured. But one thing I can say is that as the, uh, the Viet Cong had a bounty on rangers. You know, if you had a ranger tab on there, that was worth a lot of money. And so what they were going to do, they were going to transport him um, to uh, headquarters or whatever. And, um, and no telling what was going to happen to him at that point. So he said they began marching. And he said this was like a two-day march across the mountains. And he was obviously, you know, bound and, um, you know, you know being physically abused the whole time and more than that you know mentally abused they basically were telling him that you know they were going to kill him and do worse things to him and uh you can imagine you know being captured like that and and the, sort of like the you know the, the, just the atrocity that comes with war so he anyway he said this went on for a day and a half this physical and mental abuse and um to the point of which he, you know, he just almost broke, you know, he, at the, at the intensity of it. And he said that on the second day of the uh, uh, mission that they were on, uh, it just so happened that the, the Americans saw this battalion of Viet Cong and they sent in a bomber to, to basically take him out, to take out the whole battalion. And so this bomber, B-52, I guess it was a B-52, I'm not even sure what it was, but it came in, dropped its bombs, and in the ensuing chaos of the bombs, Rodney was able to escape this particular uh, situation, you know, out of there. But in doing so, um, you know, he encountered, uh, you know, several hand-to-hand -hand combat situations getting out he was stabbed by a bayonet um survived it and and returned to his uh unit it took him several days to make his way back and found his unit again and so this this is the type of stuff that he experienced for three years and obviously that takes a toll on anybody you know after you've had this type of of, of uh 
I, I, you, you can't even imagine, I guess, if you haven't been in a wartime situation, but you know, it was, it was something that, you know, you just don't forget and it stays with you your whole life. But like I said, he, you know, I, I heard, I heard so many of these type of stories that I could go on and on about. But the thing about Rodney that, that, that was so special about him was he, it's like, he had a hard time in fishing because as being in the, he was in the Rangers for 30 years and being a Sergeant Major in the Rangers, you have a, a tendency where you control everything. And in bass fishing, you just can't control everything. And that was one of the most frustrating things that he had in, in the sport of fishing was that he couldn't control the controlled or uncontrolled variables in the sport. And it really frustrated him because he was so used to that for 30 years. So. We always had talks about that, but the thing that I remember great about Rodney is like, we'd always stay like in the same campground. He, we both camped at the same time. And so every morning when we got up, it's like, we, you know, we'd get up before daylight and I don't care when it was, it doesn't matter when it was, Rodney did not own a pair of long pants. He wore shorts and sandals. He was Hawaiian. He was, and and he he never owned a pair of shorts. And he he wore shorts and sandals for five years with me. I don't care if it was thirty degrees and snowing, or whatever. He had he'd wear a raincoat once in a while over it, but he went wore shorts all the time, all year long, and sandals. And every morning, without fail, I don't care how early I got up, Rodney was already out there he had my he'd come out and he'd take my boat cover off my my tarp off my boat he'd have it perfectly folded you know off the boat everything would be perfect ready to go he would be sitting there ready to go and for five years out of all of the weather situations the elements the hardships i never heard him complain one single time and uh you know, during the course of the time we were together, he he, he lived close to Fort Benning, which is a, a ranger a military installation in, in North Georgia there. And he'd he'd have he had a lot of rain, armor ranger army ranger buddies that he would that were in active service that he would bring fishing with us. So I had a chance to really, you know, get a, a close and up personal in that in that world. Um, and it, it just gave me such a tremendous respect for for what those people do and what the, what they've what they were what they've been through. But anyway, um, uh, you know, Rodney. Uh, I guess it's been about two years ago. He passed away. Uh, you know, he's only in his early mid 60s, like that. He had some complications from the Agent Orange exposure he had in Vietnam, and um, just a, a tremendous loss. And I really miss the guy a lot. Just just one of the greatest friendships I ever had in my life. But um, I don't know, I was just thinking about that. And I just wanted to share that with everybody. Um, you know, just the memory of Sergeant Major Rodney Schmolak, um, one of the, the greatest Americans that I've ever met. I mean, just super humble guy, super uh, confident. If you've been around, if you were around Rodney, a lot of the anglers out there know Rodney. He fished for five, so many years. And so a lot of the pros know him. But um, Rodney was a, he was he was fairly short. He was only about five foot two, but he was like he was like a little five two Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he was he was one of the most kindest people I've ever met. But he was also he had an intimidating factor to him as a sergeant major in the Rangers and somebody that had had seen more death than anybody should ever have to see in his life. That he had an intimidation factor to him that was just when once you saw him you never forgot that and um uh, just super super special guy man i just I, I really miss him a lot and uh, we had so many good times fishing together um but the main the main thing that i uh will always remember about rodney is um the the last year that he uh, uh quit fishing I think he sort of knew something was going on you know with his health and he came up to me at one of the tournaments uh, the last tournaments we fished and he opened a box and he goes um he goes Randy I want I want to uh I want to give you something you know to remember me by and he opened it up and it was uh it was the silver star he won in Vietnam and <laughs> for the
Who? Um, sorry about that. But anyway, it was the, uh, the silver star that he'd won in Vietnam, and he gave it to me. Uh, and, And anyway, he uh, he gave it to me. And he just said he wanted to. He wanted me to have it to remember our friendship. And, um, <laughs> that uh, hmm. But anyway, I, I still have the silver star that he gave me. I also have the uh, the combat now knife that he carried in Vietnam with him, and uh, it just uh, was a just a really special deal. So, anyway, wanted to share that with you. Uh, sorry about getting a little emotional there, but uh, he was uh, he was one of a kind, and um, like I said, anyone that, that met him was never the same after that. So, anyway, hope you're all doing good, and hope you enjoy the stories. And next time we'll try to make them not quite so intense, but we'll talk to you later and see you.